we acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Lenni Lenape people, and we offer this land acknowledgement as a way of showing respect and honoring the indigenous peoples of the land on which we work and live. Um, I also wanna thank everyone for joining us as usual. As you know, the Clay Studio is dedicated to making art and inspiring people. And if you'd like to help us in our work, please consider making a donation. I'm going to put the link for that into the chat. And then I'm gonna show everyone a pretty cool building update with some, um, the little fun notation, which is that my, my friend, um, John Carlano sent me this photo uh, about a month ago, probably because of the colors. And then I was looking through my pictures of the building and picking out which one to show you all. And I thought, oh my gosh, it looks like Paul's cups. <laughs> so I put a little, um, a little comparison there so everyone can see. And I, it's a little bit of a preview because I think Paul might mention that architecture is something that inspires him occasionally. So we'll get back to that in a minute. All right. So to introduce you all to Paul Eshelman, the clay vessels of Eshelman pottery order and dignify human life. Clarity is given to simple forms by contrasting glazed and unglazed surfaces. Pure clean glazes render elegant presentation of food and drink. Paul's developing artistic interests were directed along practical lines as he grew up in Iowa. He received a BA in art from the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Ooh, hold on one moment, Washington, and an MFA in ceramics from Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island. Laurel received a BS in biology from Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Since 1988, Paul and Laurel have been living and making pottery in Elizabeth, a small farming community in Northwestern Illinois. They have three children who all work, worked in the pottery during their years at home. The clay body is a red stoneware. The glazes are all lead free. The wares may be safely used in the microwave and the dishwasher. That is the number one question people ask us about all the stuff in the clay studio shop. <laughs> um, so we all know that these will be things that you can use for many years into the future. Paul, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, I just want to note to everyone that the um, live transcription has been enabled. Thank you to whoever reminded me to do that. I mean, always to do so. Um, you can uh, see the captions at the bottom. They're not always exact. You can turn them off and on at your will. OK. So we're going to start by asking Paul our normal question, which is what and how and when did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? Um, well, I've, I've been interested in um, clay since high school. And, um, but, but um, kind of put it off on the on the edge of life and um, so throughout high school and college I, I pursued typical college uh, prep courses and then had a um, three years into a biology degree but on the side I, I still loved uh, making objects um, especially uh, functional ceramics was, was something that felt really close to heart and um, so when I kind of ran out of steam with the, with the biology, especially when I realized that um, my math skills were not up to snuff for uh, really a solid science, science um, vocation, that gave me the courage to kind of give it a chance. So all my family actually, my, I have three brothers, they're all in the sciences. My dad was a professor of uh, engineering. So that's kind of my background. And I had that kind of a, as a unspoken um, expectation, I guess, but um, decided to go the other way with my, with my uh, work. So, so as a junior, I transferred, I, I, I quit. 
at that point, I got married to Laurel, my wife now, and um, then started up again in Tacoma in ceramics. And uh, yeah, thought I would give it a shot. Seems uh, to have worked out pretty well. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, from, from this perspective, yeah. But at the, at the front end, it's a little real nebulous, kind of unclear how it's going to work out. And truthfully, I, I uh, thought I would go into teaching. Uh, my parents are both teachers, so I thought that's a legitimate career choice. Um, so I, and that's one reason I pursued the MFA right after grad, right after undergraduate I went to RISD. Um, so another two years of play there. And then an endless job search. I did teach adjunct for six years, but um, came to realize that uh, that would never become a full-time job. Mm. And uh, so actually that, at that point I took a detour thinking I'll use these skills I've, I've honed in, in clay and ceramics um, and get a more of a legitimate um, career as a, as a product designer. So I went back to school at Ohio State in product design and um, almost immediately I knew that was a bad fit. Um, the whole um, the whole design, the whole sense of making an object that would mimic the real real thing but not be the real thing. So a, a foam core painted to look like a, some metal surface or um, just just um, it, it didn't it wasn't in it didn't have the integrity of the craft world that I was looking for. Although I, I respect it a lot. Design is a, a great field. Um, and it taught me a lot. It taught the, the, learning that I didn't finish the program, but what I did learn was the design process. So the more of a rigorous um, and systematic process of design as well as the whole emphasis on ergonomics about how the interface of the object and the human body um, is important. That, that was really, that really helped a lot. Mm. That, you and, know, when, um, go ahead. I was just gonna say, when you mentioned that the other day, I started to think about um, the difference between design schools now and industrial design and kind of how it was when it started out in the early 20th century. At that point, there was this idea of the designer craftsman, that you would be someone who knew how to make things out of real materials and could then also maybe adapt those designs to a, a larger industrial process. And that's, in a, you know, in addition to being an artist, that's how I see what you do because you have, you know, you've designed them and then you've created your own sort of mini industrial process in a way with your with your slip casting. But um, there there was a sense that industrial designers were the ones who knew the materials and could make a real object that could then be multiplied. And then when you were saying that you had, you know, the you were being trained to make things in not the right material it just seems like such a the wrong path to go down for for design so I, I really respect that you kind of saw that that wasn't what you wanted to be doing yeah 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 I did I felt uncomfortable in that world but um actually what when I think back what led me to think about design was after I started slip casting I didn't learn slip casting in college I learned it afterwards in a workshop um with a person that was a designer at Lenox, China. So I learned the casting process in just a week long, just a little taste of it. Got into it and then I saw, I met, I ran into designers like Eva Zeisel and uh, Russell Wright, some of those mid-century people. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Whoa, this is great work, beautiful, functional. Um, and um, so maybe, I, maybe that's what I should do. Um, and yes, also the Bauhaus was definitely um, 
if you look at the work, it was craft. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's true. And that, and the fact that they were making the things in in a real way, I think, made them the designs more um, timeless, maybe, or or certainly better quality and more um, user friendly and things like that. So it's really interesting, and it's so interesting that you mentioned Linux. Um, because we actually were just contacted by Linux recently where my, you know, they're interested in, in the idea of kind of continuing their legacy as an American made handmade concern, even though about two years ago, they moved all their production is that they're originally in Bristol, Pennsylvania, which is nearby where we are. They moved down to South Carolina, maybe 20 years ago. And then two years ago, they moved everything to China. So I mean, mm -hmm. full circle that yeah. now they're coming back to the artists and they're sort of trying to. Yeah, yeah there's been a couple of um, efforts that way. Um, to get, so I, I, I the, the man that taught the class I took was King British. And this was probably in 1983 or mm. something like that. Mm. So, a lot, so they were probably in Pennsylvania at that point. Um, mm. but, there, but there are... Every, every once in a while, you hear about um, kind of industry artist um, relationship, and um, I know that um, the Finnish company, what is it, Arabia, maybe mm -hmm. they have some of that in their in their plans. So they have a they they hire artists to come in and then design their work. Um, I think one thing I saw in design though is that a lot of the the way the power structure of the corporation is the designer is not really given typically is not given too much authority and most of the big decisions are made by um Marketing. business people yeah so and and you know they want to make a profit and that's that's important but um there this, it's always tenuous to get something too edgy or too out of the out of the expected norm. I know that when um, Russell Wright designed his the classic American, um, blocking on the, the name, but his, his, Amer his, his classic dinnerware, he had a tough time getting that started at first, mm -hmm. getting anyone interested. And in fact, that became one of the most popular dinnerware sets that's been produced. Ever. I think all yes. it, but um, yeah, it's, it's it's tricky stepping out of the, those expectations. And um, in fact, in school, they did want us to study kind of current trends and then design according to those. So the color schemes and um, the kinds of objects that were, that you'd see in a magazine would be what you use as your, as your model kind of, or your inspiration. Yeah. Well, so that brings me to a couple more questions. One of them was you, you also mentioned the other day that as, as there were things that were very unattractive about that course, even in the, the short period of time you were in the design school, you said there were some, some important things you learned that you've taken with you. True, yeah, yeah. All the things I mentioned about um, the process. So when, you, when in slip casting, but basically my form is, is made before I make an object. So my forms are all done in plaster. And um, so that in that sense, I'm using the, the standard design approach in designing, in uh, making the work. So this is what, this is what the guy from Lennox taught me. And so the decision, the important decisions are, to, are decided up front versus a person that's throwing that can kind of intuitively, more organically, um, make this object and uh, kind of, if one doesn't, seems a little bit off, you can make the next one, you know, more more in the sense of, of what you were looking for. Versus mm -hmm. my work, it's all, almost all the decisions are made in that in that plaster process. Um, now I can, I can decide, well, this, this wasn't right, I'll go back and redo it, or, you know, maybe the sketch I made is, is goofy. There's always um, there's opportunities to change in that process, but once you know once the mold is made, then that that piece is designed. So in that sense, it is like in it's more cerebral, more um, 
concrete, I guess, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to more intuitive. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So when you what, you you switched from throwing to slip casting, was that when you were you had already finished grad school, or what part was? It? No, uh, <laughs> in fact, I have an image in grad school. So I kind of I loved I fell in love with throwing in the beginning. And undergrad, I was pushed to do something else, something different. So I went, I, I switched to uh, lab work. So my senior year of undergrad, all through graduate school, I did lab pop. And um, I'm not really sure to tell you the truth how I, how I decided to, to investigate casting, but I was, I, I, I could see that the, conceptual um, the conceptual there was a relationship between my slab pieces and the kinds of pots that I would make casting they're, mm -hmm. they're very different aesthetically they're they're tighter and um, more refined but the conceptual ideas are somewhat similar um, the way the a, a flat, plane can be bent and formed often is how my pieces end up um, looking kind mm. of versus the, the, the kind of um, billowing shape you would get on the potter's wheel. That makes sense. And I, you know, truthfully, I was, I was an okay potter. I wasn't great. In graduate school, I went to some, with some Kansas City people from um, Kansas City Art Institute. They were really good throwers. And I, I could get a pot up, but it I didn't sing the way theirs did. <laughs> so. oh, great. Well, we all have our strengths. I think it's a good time to keep talking and share your images. So I'm going to let everyone see kind of what you're talking about here. Um, there we go. So um, we'll do, we'll, do this little intro and then people can see some of those pots you were talking about. This is you outside of your current studio, right? Right, right. That's the studio. It's downtown, uh, very small village of Elizabeth in Northwest Illinois. So rural Illinois, about 700 people in town. And um, yeah, that's my shop. It's an old, originally a dealer, an auto dealer um, back in the late twenties. And then um, before me, it was a print shop. So. I've taken over that space. Very generous, uh, a great studio. Yeah, um, and I, I was just thinking about your your sign there and your the choice to have your graphic choices. So the font is a bit arts and crafts style, perhaps, and then you've used the Raymond's nodding. <laughs> um, you've used a silhouette of your cup which is, you know, has the same kind of sensibility as the, the letters. Did you design the, um, the sign? I did. Um, actually, yeah, I think originally it was the font was chosen by my graphic designer who did my business card way back in the day. Um, and then I had it put on the sign. Um, actually, I hired a college, a college kid to do that, do the lettering. So nice. It's a little old now, but it's hanging in there. It, it conveys a lot of information about your your work, I think. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Dedication to, to craftsmanship. So you want to tell us about this this room? Pretty exciting to see. Oh, yeah, this is the this is the cast. You're looking into the casting area. So molds, you can see molds. You can see a lot of pieces um, kind of in process. Uh, and this is pretty typical. There's in front uh, with the pink insulation foam is my casting machine. So I have a pump uh, which both stirs the clay and then I can pump it out with a kind of a similar to a gas pump, um, pump it into the mold and then drain it back into the machine. Um, on the right, you'll see that big tub. That's where I mix the slip. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, not, it's a basic building. It's not fancy, but um, very, very um, serviceable. Good floors, good solid cement floors. Is it cold in the winter? 
Uh, yeah, I do have south south exposure for the windows. So on a sunny day, I get nice nice warming from the sun. Um, but yeah, somewhat cold in the winter. You know, on a on a gray day. Yeah, like today. And there's your gas pump oh. flip <laughs> machine. It does look like a gas pump. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's, I'm sure that's where it came from originally. Uh, you know, when they designed this machine. Um, so here I am pumping up the molds, and I typically I do a series of say four, two, two to two depends on the piece, but two for bigger pieces, and then maybe eight or so if, I, if I'm doing cups. Got it. All right. There's Laurel. So there's Laurel, my wife, and I in our shop. Um, looks like we're set up for an open house or something um, because we typically don't have that many finished pieces in the studio. But. So people in your town can come come and buy stuff if they want occasionally or on special occasions? Yeah, any, yeah anytime I'm there. In fact, it's, um, you know, it always picks up a little around Christmas. Um, they get a discount to come to the shop, of course. And um, then we do things, little events um, in town. Um, so I, I have some interest in, interest in, in my work. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, I noted the other day that you had, you have 700 people in your town. I had 750 people in my graduating class from high school. So. Um, right. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking. You, I, was I like thinking, that you said downtown Elizabeth. Right. It, well, it's two blocks. <laughs> so I'm on the second block, kind of the outskirts of downtown. <laughs> That's good stuff. Um, oh, there you are with one of your pugs. So I think it's um. Well, maybe we'll talk about this after we see your, the little video. Let's let's look at some of your old work. I have some questions about like how often you change your forms and things like that. So tell us about this one. Well, this is a this is a grad school pot, um, and um, some of the things I'm working here are, are I've continued, which is both unglazed surfaces, contrasting with glaze, and then the fact that the material itself should be um, really a big part of the aesthetic of the pot. Well, that's a little square teapot. Um, and this is a tray. So you can see slab slab forms, um, pretty straightforward, simple, simple forms, um, and then glazed on glazed surfaces. Yeah. So this is at, at, in, in grad school, I was um, so I went to RISD, which is not necessarily a, known as a pottery school, at least then. Um, but but they were a couple things, they were very open to anything you wanted to do, um, whatever, as long as you did it well and could talk about your work. And um, so that was that was nice. And I, I resisted any any sense to go into anything besides pots. I did I was not interested in in doing sculpture work at all or installations or anything like that performance. Um, definitely fixed on making pots. But it, it did give me it did give me a flexibility, I think, that led me to cast to investigate flip casting at a time when flip casting wasn't really on the board as far as um, potters for the most part yeah well that's interesting I feel like there is you know from there's the pottery world and then everybody else but inside the pottery pottery world there are definitely strong opinions about throwing and slip casting and slab building and did you do you ever feel like you got pushback about the slip casting um you know it's it's um I guess I didn't pay any attention. I tried not to pay any attention to that, but um, it has changed a lot. There are a lot of in in, in academia now a lot of a um, lot more focus on slip casting, and um, I just talked to uh, Nate Ditzler, who teaches at Clark College, who's in Dubuque, and he's a caster. Um, so that's. This is kind of new in academia, I think. 
Yeah. I think once, once you add in something like 3D printing, people start feeling less weird about close <laughs> casting. <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 uh, like, like a mid-century. It's, it's well, it's twentieth century more than it's not really cutting edge, but um, it's okay now. Yeah. Well, right, and I imagine that that sort of changed over the last twenty or thirty years. So, but it's oh, very uh, much so. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Well, and that ties into uh, to the idea of just being able to make a living as a as a potter because you you know you have to have economy of, of scale you have to be able to produce the things um and you know it it helps that you have your family that is involved in helping and that you and laurel are doing the pottery together because there's also that division of labor right yeah we roped everybody in so <laughs> they all they all are on board whether they wanted to be or not um yeah, so and another thing I was thinking about in, in the beginning, um, you know, there is the pottery world and then there's the rest of the people. And when I was applying to state art shows or uh, selling things, which I did a lot of art shows over the years, my work did not appeal to everyone as by any means, but there was a segment of people that were, were, were um, attracted to it. and. It was. It stood apart from most of the other work because of its process and the aesthetic. So that, in in a sense, that work has a, has a in a good way for me, sales wise. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was actually just talking to the aforementioned neighbors this morning about the fact that the work is. It's accessible to those you know people outside the pottery world, but it's also has so much to give to a ceramics, a person who knows ceramics and, and people who know design and people who are interested in, in, in art in general. So it's, I think that it's rare to find work that has such a wide appeal. And that is not to say that it is um, not sophisticated. It is so sophisticated that people like in all these different sectors can appreciate it for different reasons, which I think is kind of what you were just saying, right? Like you have this, this wide audience. Yeah, and I, and I do have kind of, a, I think people like architects or those more um, design type, people that are into that aesthetic really um, are attracted to the work. More so than say, this is a broad generalization, but say, a, versus um, someone doing wood firing. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, because it has that sensibility of, um, you know, that although you you were not, you didn't pursue engineering or, um, you know, that math wasn't, you said, wasn't your strong point, there is an obvious love of engineering and math and design in your work. Um, I don't know if you have those the books that we, um, you, you, there are a couple of books that you mentioned that were pretty important to you, but. Um, and this yeah. Is yeah, I do. And, and I just, just as an aside, this, this desk is uh, one of the objects I made in, in, um, at Ohio State in the design program. So I was in their, their MFA program then uh, didn't last long, but this, I cranked out a few pieces. Anyway, I do have, yeah, I do have some of the books so, um, okay, let me stop the share so people can see you better and then I can go back to it. Yeah, so, so this is uh, elements of Euclid. Euclid was a, was a uh, um, he did geometry and he was like, he was Greek. So three, the year 308 BC. So he is quite old. But this book was done in, I think, 1840s hmm. by Oliver Byrne. And it's a, um, it's a visualized presentation of Euclid's formulas. So, and this is reprinted recently. So you can see there a couple of things, that all these forms fitting together in a really beautiful way um, because of the math. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then also his colors are just great. Yeah. They're, you know, they're just right on as far as I'm concerned. 
So, yeah. So anyway, this this has been an influence and um, influence in that it's not that I draw specific forms from these pictures, from these images, but it informs my um, kind of general sense of uh, where I want things to go. So those those have been. This book was pretty influential in the lit and kind of a, a more recent series of uh, objects, uh, cups with shapes on the side. Yeah, which some of them are behind you on yourself there. Yeah, there they are. So yeah, and then another one. Um, so Dan Anderson taught at Edwardsville in Illinois. Yeah, and he's been posting um, pictures of buildings for quite a while. Anyway, he, he had this book or this these images on. So I pursued that a little bit. So I'm just I just got this book. It's by Bernd and Hilla Becker. These were photographers, German photographers in like um, mid 20th century. But they have just amazing forms. These are all industrial buildings. Mm. And um, you know, I think they're great. <laughs> Yeah, well, and it, it all informed the Bauhaus, too. And then, um, you know, I think your work is also the kind of thing that looks like it, it could have could have come out of the Bauhaus, but it also looks completely contemporary today. So it's got that, again, sort of. Yeah, there's, old, there's, yeah there's old references, but yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, just that sense of shape and the like universal geometry. Um, all right, let's look at a couple other pictures here. So there's your soup bowls. Mm -hmm. And now this makes me think about the question, you know, when did you come up with this form? And do you, once you come up with a form that you love, you just keep making it. You don't, you don't worry that, you know, you don't put an end point or do you um, uh, how often do you come up with new shapes that kind of thing or are these right, unanswerable yeah. questions so those so back to the bowl that's so that's the bowl you know you make these shapes and uh, you never know what how how well it's going to be received this bowl was very well received and um since i started making it i haven't really stopped making it i'm um, not every day obviously but um it's it's, it's in production so, um, and it incorporates a couple things um, that that kind of porthole handle. So it's a handle that is uh, rather than a positive space coming out, positive uh, it's a negative space, and it also acts in in a more of an architectural way, like a window into the piece in a sort of a conceptual way. So um, those have been good. As far as new work, you know, it's that is a, a frustration, and um, I feel guilty um, often because the balance. I think the balance in my work as a production potter leans towards production, you know, pay the bills versus new investigations of work. Um, and for instance. Um, uh, when this pandemic closed things down, I thought, oh, this is this will be a great time to start cranking out some new designs. But um, it wasn't, you know, wasn't no, everybody long. wanted everybody wanted what you were already making. <laughs> well, yeah, and my website, I have a website that people can go to and purchase work, and that just went went um, because they couldn't go to art shows, um, and because galleries are closed. Um, that became the the um, their their um, venue or their their way to get my work, and um, so there has I've been I've been so busy, um, and uh, I'm not complaining. It's been great, but it has it, it, so I haven't had any chance to make anything new um, since the pandemic. Um, also, I lost some of my I lost my my employee. So I had a person that was helping me cast. He's he's got another job. So um, more on my shoulders. And um, yeah, 
Well, but hopefully, hopefully, um, January's coming, Christmas will be over, and um, things will slow down, and that's when I'm hoping to do some new work. I have ideas on the back burner um, of things that I haven't had a chance to do. So, and as far as how long I keep them in production, I'm a long time. Um, depends on if I, if I still feel good about the piece. And... Um, if it's still if if it if it's still interesting to people, mm -hmm. um, you know, someone that sees my work for the first time, they don't they don't have a notion of how long it is, and so it's it's not stale to them. Um, I, I try to keep the craftsmanship up so that it doesn't slip. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's it is kind of a frustration, and um, I don't know. Mm. I don't, well, I didn't ask because we, you know, think you should be doing something different and just, uh, just a question. Right. And, and honestly, no, keeping not. things in production is another way that, you know, for the people who don't want to have a different plate for every place setting, or they like to have a matching set, it's your work is another good place to go because you, you know, that you'll be able to get a similar mug in the future. P.S. Kiraway turned her camera on and she's, um, drinking out of one of your cups oh then she's got her other <laughs> thank you for coming prepared here away <laughs> so um, yeah so, so and she's I, also yeah, a slipcaster it, it's great to uh to be able to you know if they have a buy four mugs and they break one i can go back and make the remake that fourth um and it's a it's a strange thing some one one of the mugs i made for a while probably three four years and then I said, this is it. I'm not going to do it anymore. So um, quit, threw the molds away, threw everything away. Now, people find these things on eBay and they say, can't you make me some more? <laughs> yeah, don't throw the molds away. <laughs> Just put them in the Rain. back room. Yeah, I'm running out of room, but, <laughs> but uh, it's a strange thing. Um, so I have, I have brought back into production a couple of pieces that were sort of on the, on, in the, Kind of on this in the storage room yeah yeah well and this this is so elegant i love these casseroles and of course every time we get them in the shop they go out the door like in two days so mm -hmm. no, don't stop yeah. this one. technically those are a little trickier getting a lid to fit on a cast piece is, and then uh for me um most of my problems are with the glazing um <laughs> i have little glaze flaws that really on a you know on a more of a casual piece would uh, not be a problem but on the work that's really clean and um formal the yeah. glaze flaws just so yeah so that's a little trickier part to piece the glaze but I, it's just it's good it's functional and it i think it's i think it's a good piece yeah it sure is oh, i haven't seen this one in real life this is an older yeah, that is that is a that is a real tricky one to make. That um, that tray to get the tray to the to the through the bisque or well, it's actually the finishing of the piece. I, I break about a third of them probably. Um, it's fairly long. It's maybe eighteen inches, so sixteen inches. Um, and that that little rise in the middle is really a uh, fragile part in the raw clay so but yeah it's, it's kind of um working with the wave a gentle wave and um also um i have a few of my pieces i borrowed or, or taken forms from corrugated plastic sheeting mm. and so that's where the curves come from and I, you can't really see the cups the bottom of the cups but um, they also have a similar form, um, a little, a little bit of a, a wave in the bottom. Great. Hmm. Okay. So the better dish. Yeah, there's, so there's another example of, of that, of lifting an, an industrial surface from its original context, making a mold of it, um, and then it, it becomes this nice regular uh, wave-like form. So it has that industrial sense about it, but in a different material, in a different context, it, um, it, 
look at outside and I guess industry. Yeah. Yeah, these are some very simple mugs kind of thinking about the a pot as, um, as a athlete maybe. These would be kind of the wrestler stamps with a solid, you know, <laughs> firm. Um, they, fit, they, they sit solidly on the table versus more of a ballet dancer, which should be a, like a, a nice turned foot on a bowl, which should be lifting it up. These are very... Um, Jackie Rice, in, in grad school, she, had, she, had, she asked me, why are my pieces always truncated? So like the form just kind of ends. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't answer that, but it, it feels right for this pot to be kind of just sitting very solidly on the table. Well, there's something about, you know, when you're having your morning coffee, this makes you feel grounded. You don't feel like you have to worry. It's not, you know, so much to worry about in the morning. You don't have to worry that this is going to get knocked over. That's right. pretty comforting, so. actually. Hopefully, yeah. And, was, you know, if you think about the, the it's, it's real simple forms. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, I think it came out okay. They're it's actually really, the cup I, I use at home here. Is, is that it? The one you use at home, this one? When I'm drinking out of one of my cups, I have a lot of other cups, of course, of course but. Yeah. I was, I mean, you're sort of anthropomorphizing the, when you talk about the, what kind of athlete the cup represents. And that again, you know, with these, these nesting cups, it's kind of actually, well, and is this the same um, industrial, Plastic corrugation, is that where this one comes from too? Is that where what comes from? Is that the same as the top of the butter dish, the, um, the corrugated plastic? Yeah. Correct, yeah, the butter dish has that same. It's a, it's a, it, they make that in a couple different gauges and the, the butter dish is a smaller gauge than the tray, yeah. which is bigger corrugations, but the same, yeah, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to add this, that these are anthropomorphic in a different way in that they nest together. So they're, um, you know, they're, they're hugging. They're, they're, they're embracing these little guys. So in addition to your, your athletic people here, these are your emotional people, I guess. I don't know, but they're also very solid. So the two cups you say are, are nesting? Yeah, they're hugging. Hugging, yeah. 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 I mean, you did it on purpose, right? Oh, I see. You're, you, you're look, looking at a different cup, not the ones Wait. on the screen. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was like, I was showing you the ones that I have in my house. Oh, yeah. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think we have one or two, and then I want to show people the video of your slip casting. Okay, so these are bottles, base, small base, um, and you know this, this this very simple geometric forms: triangle, round, square, um, and um, the dynamic kind of relationship between those forms. And the primary colors, yeah. So. Primary color, right? Yeah, and this, these are the uh, cups that more, more um, obviously came from those Euclid, that Euclid book. Um, not in a direct way, but in a kind of a more, uh, just the seeds of the idea were planted and then I came up with a cup, so. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, let's show people the video and then there's some questions in the chat. So bear with me for one moment. Oh, I think I might have to remember how to do the video. The... Hmm. Will people hear? Yeah, I'll be showing you the processes of how I designed and made this bowl. Uh, handled soup bowl. So why don't we head down to the classroom and I'll show you there. We're in the bottom of the studio 
in the basement where I do all my plast work. This is where the original pieces are made. And the first thing I make is a plaster model of the shape. So it's a, a positive. From that, I make molds. So I'll make the model using woodworking tools and uh, shore form plaster tools. I set up a model, which is a plastic sheet around the piece, pour plaster in there, and the molds are what come off this model. We'll head back upstairs and I'll show you how to make the pots. So I make my own clay body and my clay is a slip, so I add the blocker and so it runs as a liquid. As you can see, going there. The machine is a pump which pumps the slip into the molds. I fill up these molds and um, set the timer for about 45 minutes, and that'll let them get to the proper thickness. The longer they're in the mold, the thicker the piece will be. So, Waiting for the bowls to be dumped. They've gotten thick enough. So this is the handled soup ready to trim. I have a fettling knife that's um, been cut off slightly so it fits inside the mold. And off the scrap, the spare, which I recycle in my next batch of clay. It's been 12 hours since I cast these and they're ready to come out. So we'll pop these guys out. These are handled soups. This step I use this template to help me guide it straight, put in the handle. So these are still very ragged. A lot of finishing will be done after they dry. So we'll let them dry about two days. Here's my kiln room. And I have a kiln that's ready to unload. I fired it off yesterday. Looks like the pots came out. I love it. It worked. You didn't have to open it and have broken pots. Right. Yeah, that's, that's always a good it. thing. You checked it before you opened it, didn't you? Ah, uh, yeah. I did. But but I'm always I am always kind of um, it's, it's kind of a um, because of. The way ceramics work, it's all red, and you know we can't really see the piece during the firing much. It always is kind of a nice um, surprise, or the, the materials worked. You know, they worked again, and it's, it's great. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. I can imagine. Um, do you? I'm going to get to the questions in a sec, but um, this might be too hard of a question or not valid. Do you have a favorite? object that you make right now like a favorite shape hmm. that you're most proud of or you're most excited about or something well you know typically it's it's the most recent one <laughs> so, um i do like those those uh euclid cups you know these um say, and i actually i use these these small ones at home a lot for tea i think they came out pretty good um, I like there's a there's a larger version of the of the soup bowl that I showed you in the demo, which is a ramen bowl. Those mm -hmm. are those have really been I think those have worked out well. And uh, we don't use them. We make ramen rarely here, but we use them a lot for soup or um, serving bowls. So those get used almost on a daily daily basis at our house, and those I think are pretty successful. Yeah, that seems like a good um, pandemic thing too. Just sitting at home with your ramen bowl. <laughs> True. True. You can get the raw ingredients here. Laurel, Laurel grab one. So here's here's that piece. Oh yeah. And then I make a, a more of a shallow a shallower version, about yay big. Mm -hmm. I call it noodle bowl. So those two, 
in our house, they get used as serving bowls. Great. Um, well, we should definitely be introduced to Laurel if she's willing. I don't know. Okay. Laurel is right here. Hi. Hi, hey, Laurel. I'm part of the team. <laughs> you sure are. Um, thanks for joining us. I am yeah, going to go you. to some questions in the chat. Let's see. Um, Raymond says he loves your materiality and what mattered in, and how it matters in your craft and design sensibility. Oh, and then he asked, is that a blunger when you were looking at your slip mixer? Blunger? Blunger? What's that, Raymond? Is that what you were asking? Blunger, yeah. Yeah, so this, that's, um, it is a blunger um, and um, it's kind of a hybrid, partly homemade. So it's a 50 gallon drum, plastic drum with a motor and a, a long, um, shaft and a propeller at the bottom, which I purchased. So um, yeah, if they're called blungers, mixing up slips. Got it. Okay. This might be more for Laurel. Let's see. How much time do you put into networking and advertising your work? Do you do this or do you delegate it? I delegate it. <laughs> but, but we don't do much of it. It just seems not much time for that. I mean, we have Instagram and Facebook. Um, I occasionally would send out emails to my email list, but I haven't done any of that since the pandemic. And you haven't needed to. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's, it's been, I guess if we would have been desperately uh, a studio full of finished work and nowhere to, nowhere to send it, we would have pushed harder, but that wasn't the case. Partly because we've done art shows for 30 years, 30 plus years, and those people are, some of those people are very faithful customers. Yeah. So. And I, I know that um, Laurel does a lot of work with the glazing. Do you two decide on, on colors together or how does the, the color and then glaze mixing happen? Yeah, so we, we do talk about it a lot. Um, and um, kind of the general sense of where I want the glazes to go. Laurel does a lot of the testing. She, her biology degree, kind of science degree, helps. Well, well, using the gram scale, but right. I'm just determined. You got to do so many tests and keep doing them until we get there. But yeah, mm -hmm. Blaze, colors are tricky, and um, sometimes the direction you think you'd like to go is a dead end, as well as the fact that glazes are not the raw glaze isn't what it, the fired glaze looks like so no and that's why the tests are important and think about like yeah. raymond's sure. um mug is sort of a pistachio and that that's a, a different color profile kind of than when you're normal your mm -hmm. other stuff is yeah so i did i do i do tend to do families of glazes so that 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 what I call a turquoise, that, that light um, blue green color, um, is in a family of four pastel colors. So there's yellow and um, avocado, kind of a light green and kind of salmon pink. Yeah, yeah, and so, that kind of makes sense too with your the shape families and and the color families together. Let's see, um, Adrian says. She wants to say her whole family loves your work. We give it as wedding gifts all the time and gift it to each other all the time. A local shop in my parents' hometown, Akron, Ohio, sells it, and it has been become a staple uh, in their family's household. Right, right. Beaver Martell Gallery. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they've been Sorry. Get nice place. Mm -hmm. Yes, and like you said, when you have work sitting around, you always have a place to send it. You can just send it to the clay studio. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> you do. We appreciate it. I, I try, anyways. No, it's great. We really we're so happy to have your work, and we it's an honor because we know I'm sure it would just fly out of your studio. Um, Raymond asks, what cone do you fire to? And cone four oxidation. So, kind of on the low end of um, of um, the mid that mid range. It and it was a choice. The cone choice was decided by the by my um, clay, which is very uh, sensitive to um, temperature change. So 
So if I fire too hot, it gets really dark and chocolatey. If I fire too low, it looks kind of washed out. Mm. So it has to be pretty close to right on the money, cone four. Mm. Got it. Um, Diana's mentioning the similarity to Heath, Heath ceramics, and that kind of uh, has that same, you know, sensibility of in mid-century industrial design kind of stuff. Sorry, my cat is, come on, you know, grab it. Um, <laughs> um, oh, Heath, yes, Heath, right. Yeah, yeah, interesting work. Mm -hmm. um, Raymond says his favorite is the ripple cup. I think that's the one I was holding up. Like Brancusi's The Kiss. Yes, I agree. Uh, yeah. I didn't think about that, but yeah, I guess that works. And Keith Gordon says, are your pots glazed by dipping, spraying, or pouring? Dipping. dipping almost almost all of them are dipping. It's, it's the best way I've found to uh, get an even coat, a nice thick coat of glaze. Um, I don't have a spray booth. I never just, well, it's kind of, not really wild about getting a spray booth going in the studio because of all the dust issues. And I, I, and I didn't have the equipment. I never came up with it. So. Yeah. Well, and then Dipping and then a lot of touching up, a lot of scraping away drips and dabbing on places where the tongs are. So. Yeah, you know, you look at it and you think how, how perfect it is, but a lot of work goes goes into making it look that way. Yeah, well, some of them don't come out perfect, but I try. Uh, and then you have those second sales that I'm jealous of. Um, Keith also asks, if, uh, like, what's the percentage of your sales through galleries versus direct to customers? OK, so now um, I'm guessing it's maybe two thirds direct customers, one third to galleries. And galleries would be a combination of wholesale where they purchase them up front and consignment like Clay Studio. Yeah, and, and we know that that's, um, you know, again, as I said, we appreciate having your work. So it's, and we know that it's not always the best, the best way to do it, but um, we try to you know, sell it fast. It's good. No, and I, I love Clay Studio. Whenever I walk into Clay Studio or like Northern Clay in Minneapolis or Eckhar in Iowa City, it's both humbling because I see so many good potters out there and inspiring. So both of those things. And I just, it's, uh, it's um, they're unique places and I, and I love it. Well, it, it helps uh, to support us. Yeah, thank you. And it does help to support us. Um, do you think you'll come back to the Philadelphia Craft Show now that you've had this break <laughs> from being a show? You know, um, we don't want to, you don't want to write it off. Um, our shows in general, um, because our online business is so robust, it's, it's been tricky to get a, a body of work put together to do a show. So the two shows we did were uh, one in Des Moines, an outdoor show, and one in a littler one in Edwardsville, mm. Illinois, uh, near St. Louis. And it was um, really good shows. They were really good, but um, it's just hard to get enough work ahead of time done. So we'll see. Yeah. Okay. I hope to. I like I like coming to Philadelphia. Um, good. Well, we'll figure out. If not, we'll figure out a different way for you to come. Great. Well, we have the our hour has zipped by as usual. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions in the chat. So I just want to say another big thank you to you and to Laurel. Thanks for coming in at the end um, and for all the work that you do together. And I love that it's a family effort. Thank you. Thanks for making beautiful things for people to use. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to do it and grateful for the Clay Studio. It's an awesome place. And um, thanks for this hour. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Laurel. Thank Thanks, all our visitors. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Oh, and I didn't even mention the fact that you're such a loyal Lunch and Learn listener that we're so happy to have you. Ah, That's my little extra. That's good. All right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.